Welcome to Divine Service on Pentecost, also known as Whit Sunday, uh, in reference to white, uh, commonly a, a day when uh, the new converts would appear in uh, covered in white robes in the church, uh, historically speaking. The service today is the chorale service. If you need a copy of the uh, printout of the chorale service in booklet form, if you'd raise your hand, uh, Alan can give you a copy. Alan, I'd take a copy of that and make it a little easier for me. And also next Sunday will be the chorale service as well. The hymns, please follow as listed on the back of the bulletin. Uh, didn't have enough numbers for the number of twos and one of the other numbers that's uh, kind of overused in the listing. And this week, as we, we focus on uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, there are a number of themes that come out, and we'll talk about those in the uh, sermon. But the primary theme, as revealed in the Collect, is that the Holy Spirit would give us discernment. That is, the ability to know the difference between truth and error, which, of course, is essential for faith. Our opening hymn then is hymn number 233, very ancient hymn for this day.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee, and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray thee of thy boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to thee a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> The Spirit of the Lord filleth the world. Hallelujah. Let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him.
O God, who didst teach the hearts of thy faithful people by sending to them the light of thy Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament lesson appointed for reading on Pentecost is recorded for us in the prophecy given through St. Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. This is the word of the Lord. Let us sit attentively to receive it. The Lord spoke through Joel, saying, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Here ends the lesson.
The Holy Epistle is recorded for us in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each in our own language in which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. Here ends the Holy Epistle.
Let us arise for the reading of the Holy Gospel, recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 14, beginning at the 23rd verse. At that time, Jesus taught, saying, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the words which you hear, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. Here ends the Holy Gospel.
please be seated. Dear fellow redeemed by the blood of the spotless Lamb of God, who, ascending into heaven, sent to his church the Comforter, who remains with us to this very day, grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The words on which we meditate are the words of the Old Testament lesson. Hear these words once again, that they may be fresh in your minds. And it came to pass afterward, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our text talks about God pouring out the Spirit in those days. If we think about the Holy Spirit and the teaching in the scriptures about the Holy Spirit, there's a lot about water to be sure. And it's sort of interesting to follow the different uh, ways of speaking of the Spirit through the scripture. And for example, the idea of water being connected with the Spirit, of course we see that in baptism and, and the ways that baptism are spoken of, sprinkling, washing, pouring, uh, immersion. And let us not forget, however, that when we go back to the very beginning of creation, the Holy Spirit moved upon the waters, contemplated upon the waters, or brooded upon the waters, however you want to translate the phrase there. Um, then again, the great flood, where God brought water over the face of the entire earth. Uh, these things have to do with the Spirit who creates by water the world and organizes it and creates faith in the believer, giving him new birth through the watery womb of Holy Mother Church. And the Holy Spirit is said to be an avenger as well. And so when the unbelieving ancient world got so bad that God had had enough, God destroyed it with, not surprisingly, water. And although on the one hand that was destruction, yet for Noah and the other seven, it was salvation from that wicked world in which they lived, which was threatening to drag them down and destroy them as well. And then we go to the children of Israel in the land of Egypt and leading them safely through water, saving them through water. The Holy Spirit there destroyed Pharaoh and his armies. Don't, don't miss these connections. Of course, when we think about the, red, the parting of the Red Sea, there's another picture, if you will, of the Holy Spirit that's given us there, and that is of wind or even breath. The Holy Spirit, even the word spirit in Hebrew and in Greek as well, and in fact in Latin, uh, has three meanings that are nearly inseparable. Spirit refers to wind. It's the word that's commonly used for wind. And the Holy Spirit 
you know, moved upon the waters. You can, you can visualize wind moving upon the waters there. And God said, and if you speak, you really cannot speak without expelling a certain amount of breath from your mouth, can you? And so God is spirit. And Jesus said in the New Testament, in talking to Nicodemus, that the spirit goes where it will. And when Jesus called upon the picture of wind speaking to Nicodemus, you understand how the wind works. You see it moving here and there. But you can't really tell where it's going or where it comes from. So it is with the spirit. It's, it's the same word. You could translate the spirit. You see the effect of it. it. It comes from here and goes there, but you can't see where it's coming from or where it's going. It just kind of does what it wants. And you could translate, so it is with the wind and everyone who is born of the wind. It's the same word. We have to use the context of what Jesus is saying to know when to translate wind or spirit or for that matter, breath. So it is with the breath of God and everyone who is born of that breath of God. And so there is a custom, even in baptism, that the pastor doing the baptism will breathe on the one being baptized, go, and say, receive the Holy Spirit, because that breath of God isn't out there floating around somewhere, but comes to us from one person to another to another. And while many in our own day, in fact, we certainly are tempted to this as well, want to believe that the Holy Spirit is whispering in our ears. Let us look at the example of the apostles. We noted last week that that was the Sunday of the waiting when the apostles were praying that specific thing as Jesus had told them to watch and pray. They were in fact watching and praying that Jesus would send the Holy Spirit. And we talked about how Jesus had said, you know, if, if you being sinful, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more your Father in heaven knows to give, and he specifically names as the good gift, the Holy Spirit to the one who asks. And then we pray that we might have the Holy Spirit, and we think, oh, now God's going to directly talk to me. But, but look at what the apostles did between the Ascension and Pentecost. They didn't wait around for some direct revelation. But if you read the account, Peter stood up among the disciples and said, you know, it was prophesied about Judas and, and this, this happened. Not it was given to me a word of revelation, but no, it was prophesied long ago and recorded for us in the scriptures, recorded for our learning. It was necessary that these things happen. And there is also this prophecy that said there would be nobody to take his place and let another take his office. So it is necessary for us then to choose one who was a witness. So they went through the disciples, the 500 or so that were gathered there. And they looked at all who had been a witness of Jesus, basically from his baptism to his ascension. Who, who had witnessed these things? And they narrowed it down to two. And they left it in the hands of God and cast lots. In, in our terms, they flipped a coin. It's not exactly how they did it, mind you, but, but that would be the equivalent of how we would do it. But they had narrowed it down. And then some have said, well, maybe, you know, maybe this was a reference to Paul and God didn't choose Matthias at that time. And no, 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 no. He too received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, which was God's way of saying, yep, you got it right. But what did Peter do? He looked to the scriptures. So when any person comes to you and says, I have the spirit and you know, I have some revelation, Remember what the Spirit says. Test the spirits, because not every spirit, that is, not every preacher that goes out, remember, breath of God and how it comes from person to person. Test the breath. 
Because not every breath that has gone out, not every person who comes to you preaching saying, oh, I'm, I'm sent by Jesus, I'm of the Spirit, you should listen to me. Not everyone is, in fact, from God, but many false breaths have gone out. Therefore, test the spirits. And if any preacher resists being tested according to the measure of the scriptures, if they resist it at all, ignore them. Don't have anything to do with them. Remember how important that connection to breath is and that it's very difficult to distinguish between breath and wind or breath and spirit. These are very intimately tied up. Just like it's very difficult to distinguish between Christ, the eternal word of God, and the scriptures, which are the word of God. Really hard to separate. Not precisely the same thing, but so intimately tied together. We take this very seriously when in the common service, which we normally use on Sunday mornings, those three times, the liturgist turns to us and says, the Lord be with you. And we respond, oh yes. And with thy breath. Because spiritus in Latin is just like pneuma in Greek or ruach in Hebrew. It means spirit and it means wind and it means breath. And so we are asking that the Holy Spirit, like it was prophesied for Jeremiah in his prophecy where God says, see, I am putting my words into your mouth. You are going to speak what I give you to say. That we want the one who is praying on our behalf, who is consecrating on our behalf, who is blessing us. We want God's word to be in his mouth and not something he pulled out of himself through his own anguish and struggles that he would speak as of the oracles of God. That is, he would speak the scriptures, teach. And we take this very seriously because the spirit gives us, the scriptures give us another image of the Holy Spirit, and that is that he is an avenging fire. Now, fire is so useful to us, isn't it? We have warmth and life because of it. We have light because of it. We can clear land with it and we can sterilize with it and it can be a fearsome power that destroys and is far beyond our control and in our furnishings we have that red oil lamp that is always kept burning to remind us that the holy spirit is always here it is red indicative of the spirit not white indicative that we retain elements from the lord's supper which we emphatically do not because we are to do what jesus said eat and drink but the red oil lamp reminds us of the spirit's presence and our text then indicates different modes of presence if you will different ways that the spirit is present this is important for us. Here, Jesus, or uh, God, Christ, speaking in the Old Testament said, in that day, I will pour out my Holy Spirit. I think it was last Sunday we heard from Ezekiel that God would sprinkle us with clean water or holy water and we would be clean or holy. And here he says, I will pour out you recognize a difference between a sprinkling and a pouring. Sprinkling is a little bit, and pouring is to pour out in a huge quantity. Or the difference between that and how Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit when meeting with the woman at the well, and he asks for a drink, and she says, you know, what's going on here? This has everything to do with romance, and it certainly did. And Jesus said, if you knew the one who asks you for water, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water which would become in you a well of water springing up to eternal life. We recognize a different mode in a glass of water that we might drink as opposed to water that would sprinkle us, as opposed to water that might be poured out upon us. 
The Spirit is spoken of in different ways. And so this text talks about in that day. There's a specific time when the Spirit would be poured out. In other words, God would just dump out the Spirit. And when it says upon all flesh, it's not talking about every human being, but in all types of flesh. It's sort of names for us. Men and women, old and young, they're all going to receive the Holy Spirit. God's not going to distinguish. And it's even more than that. Look at the people who heard the apostles preaching from all over the place and who they themselves then through the laying on of the hands of the apostles received the Holy Spirit. God was not distinguishing any longer. So back in the days of the Tower of Babel when the people had been told by God after God rescued Noah and seven others through the waters of the flood, saved them from the wicked world. God commanded them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Spread abroad over the face of the earth. And in short order, the people said, lest we be scattered over the face of the earth. So you see, calling into question the wisdom and the goodness of God in his commands. It was a good thing that God said spread out and the people said no. In order that that not happen to us, let us build a tower to the heavens. Think of the boldness in that act and that determination. We will not do what God tells us to do. Rather, we will build a tower up into the realm of God. And they declared that rather than doing this to make a name for God and to glorify him, no, they had already turned against him. But they would build this tower to the heavens to make a name for themselves. God speaks something very profound about mankind at that time. He said, if speaking one language, they begin to do this, then nothing will be kept from them. And he confused their languages so that they separated from one another and scattered abroad upon the face of the earth as he had told them to do. And I don't know that that act is that much different from the garden when for man's sake, God threw him out of the garden so that he would not reach out his hand and eat from the tree of life and live forever in his rebellion and sin. But that God, through generation after generation of birth, might finally one day bring that one born of a woman to save all of mankind. I don't know that Babel was that much different. God, for man's sake, confused the languages. And so we see the spirit working over and over where man is scattered, man is thrown out, man is separated from the holy of holy places where the Lord dwells between the cherubim. And then the Holy Spirit calls back, calls in, tears the curtain, removes the veil, and we are able to come once again, into the presence of God. Not merely that we may enter, but that God invites us to enter. And so in that day that was prophesied through Joel, when they would dream dreams and have visions, God would gather. And in that day, God reversed Babel. And there, the unifying language of the Holy Gospel was given out for everyone. God poured out his spirit on all flesh. And it isn't so much that the great gift is that they would speak in tongues or miraculous healings or dream dreams that were prophetic and would come true or any of that sort of thing. But the real blessing there, the real gift, is recorded in these words. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the great and miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost.
is that God grants that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord would be saved. And here is where our prayer for discernment on this day becomes so very important because there are a lot of false preachers out there preaching that it's all about treating God like some sort of glorified candy man because the candy man can. Hey, you can even eat the dishes. Just ask God and, you know, if you really believe and if two of you agree, you're going to get it, whatever that it is, rather than calling on the Lord in the revealed faith of the scriptures that we may ask from God that which is most important, that we may have peace with God because that Holy Spirit, that avenging fire, that raging wind, that flooding water threatens to destroy us. But we say, you are true, God. You are true in all that you say. You are true and righteous in your judgments. But we call upon your name, your eternal name, the one who was and is and is to come, the one who causes to be, the one who has revealed you to us in the hand and the nail. We call upon him and ask your mercy. And the promise is for us and for our children and for everyone afar off, all whom the Lord our God shall call and he calls and he promises peace, forgiveness of sins in the only Savior of mankind through his blood. And he pours out his spirit upon us that we may hear the breath of God and that in our speaking it may be his breath that comes forth to forgive and to bless and to bring peace. Amen. Please arise for the blessing. And now the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated as we gather our offering. Let us arise.
Almighty and everlasting God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on this holy day of Pentecost didst gloriously fulfill the great promise of the gospel by visibly pouring out the Holy Spirit upon thy chosen apostles in Jerusalem. We worship thee and give thanks to thee that by the preaching of the apostles and all true ministers of thy word, thou art pleased continually to gather unto thyself from among the sinful and lost race of man, a holy and everlasting church as the home of thine abiding presence and power among men. We beseech thee to enlighten, sanctify, and so to rule us by thy Holy Spirit that we may know, honor, and worship thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We pray thee that it may please thee even as of old, so now and ever to pour out thy Holy Spirit into our hearts, that he may come to us like the light and dew of heaven, and be in us evermore a well of water springing up into everlasting life, and that by the word of thy truth we may be preserved in the saving faith unto the end. Bring to naught, we implore thee, the wicked designs of all false teachers and ungodly men who would lead us away from the green pastures of thy word into the destructive ways of sin and Satan. Prevent the enemy from sowing tares among the wheat, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Enable us to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, that we may grow up into him in all things, who is the head, even Christ, and the lives of all who profess thy name may be to thee an acceptable sacrifice. May it please thee to govern with thy good spirit the hearts of all those in authority. Grant them both health and prosperity, long to live, and enable them to secure to all our people liberty and peace. Bless the ministry of reconciliation, that there be found everywhere faithful and godly shepherds, that feed the flock of Christ in singleness of heart and pour out thy spirit upon all flesh. Rule and direct by the spirit of thy grace the hearts of the parents, children, and servants that they may have thee always before their eyes and fulfill the duties of their several stations in righteousness and true holiness as shall be well-pleasing to thee, serving thee all the days of their lives. And do thou by thy continual aid of thy Holy Spirit, help us to increase in all knowledge, faith, charity, purity, and truth, and at last, to receive the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. We continue with the Sanctus hymn.
We sing together the prayer our Lord has taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
of Christ is given for you.
let us arise.